Thank you, choir. That first call to worship, the first song that they sang, I wanted to give you a little background on. It was written by Charles Wesley, the brother of John Wesley, uh, to be sung at the Covenant Renewal Services. And we'll hear a little bit more about that later. But the first line says, Come let us use the grace divine, and all with one accord in a perpetual covenant join ourselves to Christ the Lord. Give up ourselves through Jesus' power, his name to glorify, and promise in this sacred hour. Let us pray. God, we thank you for those who have gone before us to write words that help us to remember who we are, that help us to remember your glory. We are amazed by the many ways that you bless us. We ask that you help us to live for you and forgive us for how we have allowed ourselves to become overcommitted, overbooked, over our heads in the things of this world. Forgive us for pursuing goals that don't really matter and ignoring what is really important. Forgive us for being discontent with what we have when all that we really need is you. Restore us, revive us, renew us. Help us to be still and to focus on you and then to move and to share your will and your way. Lord, we especially pray that your presence, your comfort, and your love would embrace your people who are hurting, who are grieving, who are anxious or confused. And in a moment of silence, we lift those on our hearts before your throne. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for this place to worship, this beautiful place to live or visit, um, whatever, however it is we find ourselves here today. We thank you and we are blessed. And we now join our voices together to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Last Sunday, the first Sunday of Lent, we embarked on a focus of covenant, something that happens between two people. How many of you have been praying your covenant prayer this week? You don't have to raise your hands. but And we're going to go through it kind of line by line today. So if you don't have it with you, um, there's some at the back. Maybe you could, if you don't have one, you could look on, you could raise your hand and an usher could get you one. Um, looks like everybody's sort of, well, here's a few, few. Some weren't here last Sunday, so we'll give them a break. The rest of you, bring yours back next Sunday. <laughs> the covenant prayer is what's on the one side of this. The other is just kind of a little tidbit, so don't... Um, worry yourself with that right now, but this prayer was written by John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, to be used in the annual covenant service that uh, occurred annually. You over here, George. Uh, it was written in the 1700s, and uh, when the people came together, usually at the beginning of the year sometime, they vowed, um, they made a covenant to um, give themselves to God. The words are a little bit 
antiquated and um, a little bit unsettling if we actually take them seriously. However, the prayer has much to say to us today, or maybe we should say we have much to offer through it today. The prayer um, is to be made by those who uh, intend, who desire to give um, of themselves, to deny themselves, and to give their wills over to God's will. And this is what we practice during the season of Lent. The prayer then becomes for us a radical refocus and a reorder of our lives and our will, and a commitment to love and to sacrifice and to repentance. It is a commitment that we're making, um, but regardless, um, things will look different in our lives. We'll find ourselves in, in many different places, and so we're vowing, we're making a covenant through this prayer that we will remain true to God. We closed the message last Sunday by praying this prayer together. And this morning, I'm going to kind of take it line by line for us to gain a better, clearer understanding of what it is that we're committing to. Um, someone asked me on Wednesday night, will you be helping us to know what this means? And so, absolutely, we will. Um, the first line, I am no longer my own, but yours. This is a profession that all of the following stanzas stem from. They all stem from this. We're committing to put our lives fully in God's hands and trusting in his plan and purpose over our plans and our desires. Then put me to what you will Rank me with whom you will. Here we commit to trust God to guide us in what we do and to guide us in whom we do it with, in any capacity of authority or lack thereof. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Here we acknowledge that even as we go about doing the will of God, it's not all going to be easy. There will be suffering. And that in that suffering, we will not stop doing. Let me be employed by you or laid aside by you. We're committing that whether we find ourselves actively busy, for God, actively working for God, maybe employed by God. For most of us, that's not the case. If we're serving him behind the scenes, or if we're incapacitated in any way, that we will continue to trust God's plan and purpose. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we say, I don't have anything to offer. That is not true. God has a purpose for every moment of our lives. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Your bookmark says by you. As I was researching all of this, I found something that said the Methodist Book of Worship printed that wrong. It's supposed to say for you, not by you. So if you want to pencil that in, you can. But there will be days where we are on the mountaintop and there will be days when we, were, we are in the valley or even in the gutter. In either case, we will allow ourselves, we're committing, to be used for his glory. Let me be full, let me be empty. This could be physically or spiritually, financially, emotionally. Again, we are committing to trust God regardless of where we find ourselves. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. We're committing here that possessions, 
and wealth or lack thereof will not have bearing on our love and loyalty to God. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. What does freely mean? Free, will, right? Without coercion or guilt or obligation, we freely and completely submit everything to God. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. Here we circle back to the beginning, acknowledging that God deserves everything that we have, our honor, our praise, our very lives, and that we're making a covenant with him, that he is ours and we are his. He will be our God and we will be his people. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Meaning the covenant we make in this prayer is the same on earth as it will be in heaven. Amen. So use this prayer um, during this Lenten season to help you focus and um, to remember the sacrifice that has been made for us and then our response as a result of that. These may be old words, and we certainly aren't going to get them all right. But if the desire is there, they are relevant words. And I pray that we will not discard them in favor of something newfangled. Rather, find them useful like the faithful before us have. Useful in recommitting our faith and our covenant with God. This is a covenant of old, brought to a new day, like our scripture for this morning. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, God. You may be seated. So this passage reminds me a little bit of the phrase, out with the old, in with the new. It's typically thought of when we're talking about removing something old in favor of gaining or putting in something new. We might use the phrase, out with the old, in with the new, at a New Year's celebration. Letting go of one thing with the expect expectation of gaining something else could be a way to look at it. Women kind of use this mantra to justify buying new clothes and shoes and house decorations. Well, I'll just get rid of this and get something new. Out with the old, in with the new puts an emphasis on what's to come on the new with a somewhat negative